Hello. Welcome to today's seminar. We have the pleasure to have Katrin Altweg as invited speaker with us today. Katrin is professor, I believe now emeritus, at the University of Bern and an expert in mass spectroscopy, especially cometary mass spectroscopy. She was already involved in the mass spectrometer on the Giotto mission to Comet Halley in 1986, and she is a PI of the Rosina instrument on Rosetta. Thanks for coming. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I assume that you all know her and him. <laughs> I always start my, my talks with showing the cartoon because it's so nice. It's even nice for adults. <laughs> so that, that's the cartoon which shows 2014 when Rosetta woke up after the hibernation and finally got to meet Tsuyumov Gerasimenko. Rosina, one of the instruments, is on the orbiter, so it's not on Phila, it's on the orbiter, and was then starting to measure in August 2014 for more than two years until end of mission, 30th September 2016. Now, Rosetta, what does it stand for? Actually, the name, as you might know, comes from this uh, piece of rock where you have in three languages, hieroglyphs, Egyptian, Demotic, and ordinary Greek, three times the same text. It's the first dictionary on Earth. And this rock helped to decipher uh, hieroglyphs. And so I think, uh, as far as I know, Rosetta was chosen as name for the mission because uh, it should study a small piece of the solar system and decipher the origin of the solar system. As simple as that. So it's a huge piece of work for Rosetta just by studying a four kilometer large body to find out everything about the solar system. And Rosina, the instrument uh, I was PI of, uh, was looking at the chemical composition of the comet. At the chemical composition of the ices. So not of the dust, but of the ices in the comet. And we got quite a lot of different species, and each species actually tells its own tale. How it was formed, where it was formed, what the conditions were, where it was formed, and how it survived into the comet. So if you look at the uh, the history of the material, you start in the interstellar medium, where you have material from dead stars, atoms from dead stars, and then dust from dead stars. And here the temperature is very low, it's 10K, and the density is quite low. You form then dark molecular clouds, where the density is higher by almost a factor 100. The temperature is still very low here. 10 to 20K, star forming a region when these uh, dark molecular clouds collapse. Then you have uh, 10 to the 6 per cubic centimeter as density. Temperature in the outskirt of, of this uh, star forming region is still very low, but close to the star forming, where the star is formed, you have 100K. And that's when you sublimate what you produced here, part of what you sublimate. From this, you go to the protoplanetary disk, where in the outskirts, again, temperatures are quite low, 30K or even lower, but in the interior near the star, uh, of course, it's very hot at that time. And finally, you build your solar system, and finally, maybe life. And all the, these stages have their own chemical and physical conditions. And studying a comet, you can have some glimpses of what happened here, 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 and here. So that was the idea. 
The payload of Rosetta, as you see here, we had, of course, a very nice camera. We had actually also the navigation camera, which was also very nice. You have a suite of dust instruments, a suite of spectrometer, optical spectrometer in all wavelengths, uh, plasma instruments to study the interaction with the solar wind. Then these, uh, the radio experiment you always have, it has zero kilograms, so that's nice. But we also had the concert, the Comet Nucleus Sounder, where you have a transmitter and a receiver on Rosetta and another one on Phila, on the lander. And then you can have your electromagnetic wave traveling through the nucleus. And finally, the land of Phila with, with nine experiments. Now, if you don't look at this one, you see the heaviest instrument is Rosina. And I always claim the heavier, the more important, <laughs> which some people don't believe. But <laughs> so that's Rosina. Rosina stands for Rosetta Orbit, it stands for Ion and Neutral Analysis, so it's an abbreviation. And it actually has three sensors. That's DFMS and ARTOF, two mass spectrometers for the volatile part in the coma. And then we have COPS for the total density and the ram pressure here. And finally, so DFMS is Double focusing mass spectrometer, I will come back to that. That was our workhorse all the time. It has a very high mass resolution, at least for space. In the lab, of course, you can have much higher mass resolution, but if you fly it on space, in space, uh, that's as good as it gets. And it's the only instrument so far with this mass resolution ever flown. That's how the spectrum looks like. It's mass 14, and you see clearly three peaks. It's N, it's the CH with the C13, and it's CH2. Very well separated. Then we have a time of flight instrument, ARTOF, about one meter length. It has a high mass range, and in principle, a high sensitivity. Also, we actually had some problems in space, so we lost some of the sensitivity. And it was built to, to look at the organic material. And with the time of flight, the good thing is here you have to measure one mass after the other, so it's slow. And this is fast. You get all the masses together. You extract your ions, which you have in your ion source, and you extract all masses at one time and they will travel through the spectrometer and, and you get the spectrum like this. Then finally, COPS, the pressure sensor, it measured total and ram pressure of the neutral gas, and in this sense, it measured the wind of the comet. If you have a gas which moves, it's wind, and it was also used by navigation to look for the effect of, of ram pressure on the spacecraft from the comet outgassing. And finally, of course, we have a, a DPU, data processing unit. We built it in 1996. Uh, at that time, computers were already invented. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, it's, it's not the Pentium. It's, it's 386. But it has no Windows, no Mac, so it just worked. <laughs> that's DFMS. And DFMS, that's what you learned in school. It consists of an ion source, so you have to ionize the gas first with electrons from a hot filament. And then we transfer the ions through this transfer optics to separate it mainly from the dust in order not to have dust in our analyzer. So it's, dust will not be uh, deviated here by the electric field, so it will just go straight, whereas ions will follow the right path. Then we have an electrostatic deflection, which filters the energy. And then we have a permanent magnet, which filters the momentum. And together, you, you get the mass. But you get only one mass at a time. We have some zoom optic to enlarge the image of the entrance slit. And finally, we have a two-dimensional detector to record uh, the peaks. 
So if you have a particle coming from the comet, uh, it will be ionized, it will be uh, deflected through the, uh, this optics here, through the electrostatic analyzer, through the magnet, and into the, onto the detector. If you have at the same time a heavier molecule, of course, you also ionize it. It will also go through here, but then in the electrostatic analyzer, it will hit the outer wall, or if it is lighter, the inner wall, and if it still goes through, then latest in the magnet, it will just be lost. And that's how you separate them. And then you have to change the potentials and you can measure the next mass. If we look back 30 something years to Halley, I was already involved as Michael told you. Um, the NMS, the neutral mass spectrometer on Chotto, it had a mass resolution of about 40, that means one mass unit. And that was the sensitivity, it's about 10,000 per cubic centimeter, which it could uh, sense. Now if you compare it to Rosina, you see we have done quite a good job with Rosina in the last 30 years. That's just one of the first mass spectra. Um, actually not, but it's one of the mass spectra in March 2010. Now you tell me in March 2010 we were not at the comet, which is correct. Uh, what you see here is dirt of Rosetta, outgassing of the spacecraft. And you see you have mass line on every line here, and that's glue, it's, uh, it's break cut, the vacuum grease you use for the joints, and so on. So uh, we could get very nice mass spectra already in flight. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> we could at least test the instrument. So that's low resolution. The FMS has two modes, low resolution, high resolution. That's low resolution here. Now if you compare that to the Chotto instrument, with Chotto we could have seen this here. And the other uh, famous mass spectrometer was flown on Cassini, the INMS. And with Cassini, you would have seen this here. So the PI of Cassini once told me, uh, Hunter wait, you have a very dirty spacecraft. <laughs> and I told him, well, you just don't see it with Cassini. <laughs> so in August 2014, we, we were close to the comet and that was one of the first things we saw. And that's with COPS. So the total density started to wobble here, up and down and up and down. And then we had some higher signals and some lower signals. Now this you can understand if you look at the funny shape of this object here. Because here, when it's high, you're facing a large area of the comet with the spacecraft. And when it's low, you're facing just the head or, or the bottom part. So the, the area is much smaller. And here we are over the northern hemisphere, which is at that time the summer hemisphere. And here we are over the southern hemisphere, which is the winter hemisphere. So in the north, it's warmer. You get more uh, outcasting than in the south at that time. What was quite interesting, and I show here measurements from Virtis, the infrared. Uh, you see here, that's water coming out, and at the same time, CO2 coming out. So the comma is not only variable, what we see here, but it's also heterogeneous. And that's quite intriguing. So our instrument was designed to measure isotopic, isotopologues, isotopic ratios, and molecular abundances. Of course, also elemental abundances. Now, what did we measure and what did we learn? So one of the first measurements was the deuterium in water, the HDO compared to H2O. 
But later on, we also found the doubly deuterated water in, in comet uh, 67P. So these are the measurements. You see on mass 19, you have 18 OH, fragment of water. Then you have the H217O and the HDO. And it was immediately clear that this peak is higher than this peak, so uh, the deuterium has to be higher than the 17O. Then we have uh, the doubly deuterated on mass 20. You see the peak here, the small peak, but it's clearly there. And as a comparison, we also have the HDS, the deuterium in, in H2S. So this view graph you might have seen before. It tells you about D over H in different bodies. So you, ha you have the Earth, you have your protosolar nebula, what we think it was in the beginning. You have the big planets down here. And then you have all the comets. Uh, so these are meteorites, but here you have the comets. All of the Oort cloud comets are enhanced in deuterium by approximately a factor two, some a little bit less, some a little bit more. Then we had Halley here, and here we have hardly two and a very new measurement of Wirtanen, and they are terrestrial. These are highly active small comets, Wirtanen and hardly two, and also 45P. And then you have 67P up here. So it's a comet with a very high D over H. Not like this. So it's not a distinction between Jupiter family comets, because they all belong to the Jupiter family comets and Oort cloud. But it's really a distinction between these highly active comets and all the other comets here. So what does it mean? That's uh, when I started out in cometary science in 86, there was, it was easy. All comets came from the Oort cloud. And then somebody invented this uh, Kuiper belt, unfortunately. So then we had two reservoirs, either Oort or Kuiper. And uh, then it got even more complicated. So at that time, it, it was still easy. We knew that Oort cloud comets formed closer in than Kuiper belt comets, which would eventually explain the D over H. Well, it actually didn't, because for hardly two, a low uh, D over H would rather say that it was formed down here. But then it, it got even more complicated uh, as comets can migrate from one reservoir to the other and become a centaur and, 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 and that, so on. So now it's, it's easy. We don't know where they come from. <laughs> so we, we uh, did some more D over H over the mission. And you see it's, it doesn't change with time. That's, that's different periods. When we did it, it's always this 5.3 times 10 to minus 4 for the D over H. But then we, we could measure the doubly deuterated no, uh, water. And this now tells you another story. That's a paper by Furuya in, in 2016, I think. He explains a high D over H in uh, for star forming regions, in water in star forming regions by this scheme here. You have dust grain. Then first you have a water-dominated layer because you still have a lot of hydrogen and oxygen. And this, of course, has a low, a lower, um, now this ratio has a relatively low doubly deuterated water. I should say like this. Smaller than, than the ratio for the singly deuterated water. But then once you run out of hydrogen and oxygen, then you form CO and the methanol-rich layer, that's the layer two, where the deuterated species are clearly enhanced. And so you have here a quite a high doubly deuterated ratio, also in water, which you still form here. 
Now, if you then go with this ice into the protozoal nebula and you sublimate the ice, because you get closer to the sun, then you have this isotopic exchange ratio. You doubly deuterated oxygen will react with H2O, with the light, and will exchange uh, isotopes, and you get this here. So what you do, you dilute your doubly deuterated water. So statistically, if everything goes into uh, sublimation and has enough time to react, you will get one fourth for this ratio here. And in 67p, we get 17, which can only mean that the water was never sublimated. So we had ice from the star-forming regions, and this was incorporated into comets as such, as ice, not as gas. We can, uh, could also measure the, the oxygen isotopes in water. And what you see here is it's enhanced in the heavy isotopes in 18O as well as in 17O. And that's now compared to some meteorites. The sun is down here. And this COS, don't ask me what it stands for, that's looked at as primordial water in meteorites. And that's up here. And 67P is right on this uh, line here, relatively close to, to really primordial water. So this uh, actually tells you that it probably never sublimated, came as ice and uh, stayed as it was before. Another nice uh, measurement we could do was very early in the mission. It's silicon isotopes. So you tell me silicon is not volatile. I fully agree. But uh, early in the mission, the solar wind could still penetrate to the comet because there was no atmosphere around it. And it, it sputtered silicon. It sputtered a few other refractory things, but uh, among others, silicon. And this we got into our mass spectrometer. And we could actually measure the silicon isotopes. And as you see here, solar would be here. And we are uh, depleted in 30 and in 29 compared to 28 here. This here is the carbon isotopes in CO, which is actually on the same mass. It's also 28. To show that it's not the spectrometer, which makes some fragmentation. So this is solar, that's okay. It's really on, on this point here, where the silicon is depleted in both. <coughs> and we were able to measure sulfur isotopes, also 33 and 34, in different molecules. It's in H2S, that's the blue one. So this uh, big circle shows you all the measurements and the blue a triangle here shows you the mean value plus the uncertainty. It's two sigma here. And then we have CS2. The, no, the, the blue is CS2. The black is H2S. And the green is SO2. They are all depleted in 33 as well as in 34S compared to 32, the normal. And you cannot explain it by either of these curves here. One is a photo dissociation, and, and the other one is mass dependent fractionation. It does not fit. Again, we can compare it with meteorites, of course. And you see for the silicon, it's right here where all the silicon carbide grains are uh, from supernova. So supernova silicon carbide grains, IDPs. It's not really meteorites, it's IDPs. And if you look at the sulfur, again, here we have the pre-measurements from, from 67P, and here you have this silicon carbide supernova grains. So it seems that the isotopes 
In 67P resemble mostly these silicon carbide grains IDPs. N15. N15 is, is still a mystery and we haven't solved it. So it stays a mystery. But what we observe is that in solids, the Earth, uh, Mars, and so on, and in meteorites, N15 is heavily enriched compared to uh, what we have in the sun. And also what we know for comets from remote sensing. And then on the other hand, you have the sun and you have Jupiter and there uh, N15 is poor. So the gas is poor. So it seems that you have a differentiation between the solids and the gas. And uh, if you look at star forming regions, protostars and pre-stellar cores, it depends a little bit on which molecule you look at. You see HCN, HNC, they are mostly enriched in 15N by a factor two or more. Then CN, in contrast, is more or less solar. And then NH3, you have some which are depleted in 15N. Others are enriched and others are solar. You don't know. So uh, people talk about multiple nitrogen reservoirs. They claim that nitriles, HCN, HNC, come from the atomic nitrogen reservoir. The nitrogen hydrides, NH, NH2, and so on, they come from the molecular nitrogen reservoir. Don't ask me why they have different N15, but uh, okay. And NO, the nitrogen oxide, is cycling between the two and is responsible for the CN, which does not correspond to the HCN. So that's the, the chemistry. Now, if we look at comets, you see it's extremely homogeneous. HCN, CN, NH2, they all have the same value, 144 plus minus 3. Which is surprising. Uh, okay, now people say N2 has to be uh, nitrogen 15 poor. What could we do with uh, 67P? We have looked at this ratio and we get very close to the ratio we have here. It's a little bit lower, but if you look at the error bars, that's, that's okay, 115 plus minus 14. Um, NO, which should be cycling between the two reservoirs. We could also do, you see the 15 NO here, the NO here, together with the phosphorus, and you get again the same value within error bars. So the only hope to explain this is N2. And N2, it was the first time that N2 could be really measured in a comet. We measured it over the mission. These are the main nitrogen bearing Molecules, N, N2 is, is difficult. On mass 28, you have CO. And on mass 29, you have the 13 CO and you have HCO. And 15N, 14N is just in between. And it's much smaller than the CO. So it's very hard to get it on mass 28, 29. But there is hope we can get it on mass 14, 15. Because in the iron source, uh, everything is ionized, but also fragmented. So N2 goes into N plus. So beginning of the mission, we had uh, NH3. We didn't have really, um, no, we had all of them, NH3, HCN, N2, and NO, in different ratios relative to water. And end of the mission, August 2016, we only had HCN and uh, N2. So we don't have to care about fragmentation of these two. 
the N14 will not come from NH3 or from NO. We know, because there is none. And fortunately, HCN does not fragment very well into N+. It fragments into CN, but not into N+. So that's the contribution from these molecules to N14+. plus. So it's very little from NH3. It's about 30% from HCN, end of the mission, uh, nothing from NH3. It's 30% from HCN, end of the mission, and most of it comes from N2. So two-thirds of the N14 comes from N2. And now if we measure the 15N, uh, it's mostly from N2. And so this gives you a value for this uh, 15 n to 14n, and it's again the same. So it's not that the nitrogen, the molecular nitrogen reservoir is nitrogen 15 poor, at least not the reservoir where the comet got its n2. We don't know. It's up to you to find a solution to that. We don't know, but we can say in the comet, all the n is enriched in 15n. Xenon, a very interesting uh, molecule because it has nine stable isotopes. And they are formed by different uh, uh, formation processes in stars. So the P process, which makes mostly 124, 126, is in supernova. Then you have the S process, which give, comes from HEB stars, partly and partly from neutron star mergers, uh, which gives 128 to 132. And then the heavy ones, 134, 136, is due to neutron star mergers. Xenon in our atmosphere is strange. It's depleted. Relative to other noble gases, relative to chondrites, you see we miss xenon. So we have neon, argon, krypton, and then we miss xenon. Also, xenon is the heaviest. We should not lose it or have lost it. But the explanation here is that you can ionize xenon much better than the others, and you can lose ions much better from our atmosphere or magnetosphere than you lose neutrals. So that's how they explain uh, this deficiency. And then if you look at the isotopic ratios compared to solar, so that would be solar, then you see that we lost probably more of the light ones than of the heavy ones, which makes sense. You have a peak here. This was uh, said that this is due to uh, iodine 129, radioactive decay from the Earth's mantle. And this is actually a clock for the formation of Earth's mantle. So that was before um, 67P. Now you can correct for this mass loss because the lighter ones are uh, more easily lost than the heavy ones. So that's a mass dependent fractionation. And if you do that, you see you are solar up to 132 and you are actually deficient in the heavy ones in our atmosphere. Not so in our Earth's mantle. You have the heavy ones, but in the atmosphere they are missing. Uh, so uh, 40 plus years ago, they, they uh, requested that U xenon, U standing not for uranium, but for ur primordial xenon. And it has never been found, not in meteorites, not in the sun, not on Mars, never. Until 67P. Now 67P has this, approximately this uh, behavior. These isotopic numbers here, you see 67P is depleted, is heavily depleted in the heavy isotopes. Now if you mix 22% 67P with our Earth's mantle, 78% of our Earth's mantle xenon, you exactly get our atmosphere, including this peak here at 129. So if you believe in this, you can actually calculate how many comets 
were delivered to Earth. I will come to that later. Summary, these are all the, the isotopic ratios we measured, and you see that none of it is solar, not a single one. Uh, conclusion for this is uh, mixing in the butter solar nebula was inefficient. It cannot have been mixed because otherwise it would be solar. And the butter solar nebula chemistry was probably not very important. So that makes it a little bit smaller, this picture here. Um, the conclusion is big grains in this uh, size range must have formed fast and far out in cold regions, and they must have formed fast. Otherwise, you would have had the mixing. And uh, so that's uh, an ALMA discovery. These pressure pumps, if you look at these uh, protosolar nebulas, you s and you look at the size distribution of the dust, you very often see something like this. In one sector, you have big dust down here, and here you have fine dust. And that's explained by so-called pressure pumps, either caused by a planet forming nearby, or it actually could form all by itself. And in these pressure pumps, velocities, relative velocities are very limited. So you have very gentle collisions that can actually grow to millimeter size, which is observed uh, with ALMA. And maybe that's a comet factory, maybe. And that's an artist's impression how it looks like. You have fine dust here, you have the big dust here, and in here you have a planet which forms and which causes this pressure bump here. You see the planet. It's causing this. So that was isotopes. It's very rich in isotopes. The, the comet, and, and we were lucky to get quite a lot of them. Uh, molecular composition. One of the biggest surprises was the oxygen, O2. I learned during the Halley time that O2 cannot exist because it's very reactive. It will never be stable over four and a half billion years. It will not be stable in the solar nebula because you have way too much hydrogen. So O2, no. Uh, it was one of the first molecules we actually detected. And I closed my eyes and said, no, I learned no O2. That must be an artifact of, of the instrument. But then we really found that it, it scales with 1 over r squared to, to the distance of the comet. It persisted. It was always there. And it followed very well the water. You see here the four uh, main molecules we had, water, which is the black one here. Then the CO2, the red one, the CO, which is this uh, blue one, and finally the green one, which is the oxygen. And if you, that's very early in the mission, you see oxygen follows water, not CO and not CO2. That's during perihelion. Again, the bump here is larger for oxygen like it is for water, but it, it does not follow the CO. Uh, and finally, end of the mission, again, this dip here is only seen in water, not in oxygen, uh, not in CO and not in CO2. So oxygen seems to be embedded in water ice. And that uh, led to two uh, models, how to create this oxygen. One is in the gas phase in star forming region. Oh, no, it's not the gas phase, it's on, on grain surface chemistry. It's star forming regions together with water, and uh, so it's embedded in water. And the other is by Take. No, no, that was by Take, and Moses claimed that it's done by radiologists on the ice grains, but pre solar. It cannot be in the solar nebula because you don't have the necessary radiation there. Um, so the question is, what is it? 
We were able to measure the oxygen isotope 17O in O2, not the 18O, because that's in the slope of H2S, which is very abundant, but the 17O is quite nicely separated from HS. You see the peak here. You have the O2H, which is somewhere here, but that's minor. So the 17O, 16O is here, and from this we get the ratio which is very much enhanced in 17O. And it's not like water. We also did it in water. And that's the value you get. Ah, that should read 17O to 16O is 2,182. 17% enriched, whereas in O2 it's 40% enriched. So the radiolysis theory probably does not work. If you make from water O2, then you expect the same isotopic ratios. So uh, is it gas phase chemistry or water radiolysis? It's definitely a Tocke which wins here. Another indication of uh, molecular cloud chemistry is the sulfur. Sulfur in the interstellar medium is cosmic, relative abundance is cosmic. In star forming region, sulfur is depleted by a factor up to 10 to the 4. Sulfur is just missing in star forming region. And that's quite strange. One explanation is that sulfur is in H2S. H2S undergoes radiolysis and then forms S2, S3, S4, up to S8. And then sulfur is more or less a refractory. And this you don't see if you look uh, remotely. You don't see S8 and you don't see S3 or S4. Now, uh, actually we see them. We see S2, S3, S4. We don't see the heavier ones because our mass range ended and they are probably not volatile enough to be seen, but we see at least the starting point of this series up to S8. So we probably can confirm that H2S underwent radiolysis. What is strange here is the S2. So that's H2S versus H2O over a large uh, time series around perihelion. Then CS2, it's just versus H2S, straight line more or less, SO2, more or less a straight line except here. But then you have S2, it's here all the time, and then during perihelion it went up. And that's, that's more than, it's almost a factor 100 that the S2 went up. So it means we have two sort of S2. We have a very volatile, which you see far from the sun, and you have an S2 which you only see when we are close to the sun. And that's probably related to this here. We have a refractory S2, or it's maybe S3, S4, S whatever, which uh, fractionates and fragments in our ion source. So that's the refractory part and that's the very volatile part. Now S2 in the gas phase, if it's volatile, it will not survive long. The lifetime is less than 30 seconds at 1 AU of this molecule. The fact that we see it means that it was always in the ice, otherwise it would have gone. Like the doubly deuterated water, this can never have been sublimated in the solar nebula. So that's the sulfur species we observed, and that's a model done by, for, for this uh, dark molecular cloud. That's the, the degree of hydrogenation in percent, so that's zero here, and that's 100% hydrogenation, and that's the enhancement by cosmic ray. And now orange should be yellow here, but uh, if you compare this, you see that we are somewhere in between. So little hydrogenation, but a lot of cosmic ray enhancement, if this model is correct. Yeah. 67P is underabundant in argon or, the, or overabundant in krypton and xenon. Another fact. You see that's amorphous ice and the trapping efficiency of amorphous ice for noble gases 
Uh, so here we have xenon to argon and krypton to argon. That's solar values. If you are at 30 K, you trap everything. If you are at 40 K, you trap less argon. You still trap the krypton and xenon and so on. So that's this curve here measured uh, by a group in Tel Aviv. 67 P is up here. So you would say it's formed very warm and it still doesn't fit. But it could also be that 67P actually lost the argon. Maybe it was really trapped here, but it lost the argon because argon is very volatile. And we, we really found that we have 4% O2, which is a lot. We have 0.5% CO. Then we have CH4 and 2 argon. We have all the very volatiles but they are all somehow depleted compared to Oort cloud comets or compared to what we expect. So it still shows you that comets were formed cold because otherwise they would not have trapped them. Uh, but they are on the low side and this is maybe due, it's a Jupiter family comet. Jupiter family comets spent up to 10 million years as centaurs. And there are models how warm a comet gets in the center stage. Well, there are a lot of assumptions, but you see it can go up easily to 120K. And during this time, it could have lost the very volatiles. Not all of them, but part of them. Organics, a very wide field. I guess you all know the zoo, if not. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> I'm not a chemist. I'm sorry for that. But, uh, <laughs> so when we started to see all kinds of organics, the only way to remember it was to put it into an animal. And you see we have giraffes. These are long carbon chains. We have uh, elephants. These are ring molecules, PAH. We have uh, the stinky ones, sulfur bearing. The funny ones, which are all the alcohols. Of course, the, <laughs> the peacock, which is solitary but noble, with the noble gases. Um, these are exotic birds, because I didn't know where to put them. <laughs> <laughs> these are the halogens, which remind me of seawater. And then we have the zebras. The zebras all smell of horse manure. And of course, as you know, uh, lions feed on zebras. And uh, you can actually, for methylamine, together with CO2, without liquid water, uh, form glycine, which we found. So uh, that's my zoo. And it actually has, and this here is what the Cosima, the dust experiment found, they found a lot of macromolecules, organic macromolecules, which resemble somehow the inorganic, uh, the, the, no, the organic insoluble material. So we see long carbon chains, these macromolecules. Uh, this is also seen by the infrared on the surface, then polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and it's definitely more complex than anticipated. We never calibrated most of them because we didn't expect them. So we are still calibrating now. It's the spare instrument. If you compare what we found with what has been found in, in uh, clouds of high and low mass protostars, then you see that there is at least a similarity in abundance here. It's normalized to methanol here. And recently we found a new animal. It's the salty. It has, uh, the, the footprint is hard to detect. Because sometimes you see zebras, you see snakes, or birds, or fish. And if you see several of them together, you have to be careful. It might be a salty. And that's the salty here. Um, what does it mean? End of mission, a few, uh, few weeks before end of mission, we started to fly ellipses. 
ellipses, which had three-day period, always the same period, and we just shifted the pericenter closer to the comet. Because the comet had 12 hours uh, spin period, we always encountered the same spot on the comet when we were at pericenter which at that time I thought uh, it's no good, but now I'm convinced it was actually good because the pattern we got is very repetitive. Until September 5, you see then the black line that's from COPS, the density, it started to get bumpy here. Here we reached the limit of COPS and that's dust impacts. And this here is the filament current of DFMS, and you see at 1814, we had a huge peak in the filament. And that means the, the filament is regulated to the electron current it emits. It means that something solid must have been in our electron beam. And that was a dust grain. One or more, uh, several dust grains, big ones. So if we look at these ellipses, every three days, so that's on 30th of August, 2nd of September, and 5th of September. At the same time, we got the same mass spectrum. It's very repetitive. So we have OH, NH3, which is minor, and then the isotopologues of CH4. And then, on an hour later here, at 1807, we had a factor 100 more water, a factor 100 more NH3 and no more isotopologues here. They were gone. And two hours later, at 8 o'clock in the evening, water was back to almost nominal, and NH3 stayed high. It didn't disappear. The isotopologues were still gone. Now we could see that uh, on other masses as well. This is mass 36, so these three are before the event. They are repetitive, as I said, we have H234S, and we have the C3, and we have some argon. And then we had the big event, HCl came out of nothing. We didn't have it before, now it's the highest peak. This is enhanced, this is enhanced. And two hours later, HCl was still the biggest, H2S was back to nominal, and C3 was gone. And argon was gone, no argon. So the reason here, I think, is ammonium salts. Ammonium salts, they have a high sublimation temperature. Not all have the same uh, temperature, but they are generally higher than water. And these are the salts. So this is the NH4Cl. If you sublimate this, you get NH3 plus HCl back. If you sublimate this, you get HCN plus NH3 and so on. If I look at all the species up to mass 60 and compare this period after the event with the period before the event, I get this picture. Everything here is enhanced after the event and everything down here is slightly depleted or heavily depleted. Everything which is green is associated to ammonium salts. The ones with a ring around it are species which we have not seen in the normal coma. And the one with the black triangle here are hydrogenated species. So this tells me that there were quite a lot of ammonium salts on these dust grains we got. And uh, we actually have identified five ammonium salts. Is this important or not? Um, yes, it is. So from ammonium salt, you can form some of the nitrogen-bearing molecules we see, like cyanamide or formamide. You can also form prebiotic molecules, like urea, which we probably also see. We cannot uh, distinguish it easily from uh, the NH4 acetate but it's probably rare because that's more stable. Then it could be a, an explanation for the extended source because it's mostly on dust grains and so it will sublimate only in the coma, not on the nucleus. 
because in the coma, the dust grains get hotter. And then some comets exhibit a high NH3 over water, and these are comets which go close to the sun. I will show a picture then. So that's uh, comets, NH3 to water, and that's the heliocentric distance, and you see there is a clear trend up here. From 0.2467 p outside of 2 AU to uh, 3%, 3.5% for comet Eisen at 0.35 AU. So there is a clear trend here. And how do you explain this? In addition, they saw a distributed source from, for NH3 for this comet here. So the NH3 does not come from the nucleus directly, from, but from the dust. So the best explanation is probably ammonium salt. And, and that, on the other hand, means that if we look at comets here, we miss most of the nitrogen because NH3 is the main nitrogen-bearing molecule. If it does not sublimate, we don't see it. So we may miss most of the nitrogen in most comets. If we now assume that this nitrogen is actually in ammonium salt, that's the elemental abundance relative to silicon for comet Halley and comet 67P. That's a very old picture from Geis in 80 seven or something, you see, so it's relative to silicon, hydrogen relative to silicon, the sun is here, comets are solar in oxygen and carbon and are depleted in nitrogen. And 67P is even a little bit more depleted than Halley here. Depends a little bit what you take for the dust to ice ratio. If you now believe that actually the NH3 should be 3.5%, as in, in this comet which went very close to the sun, you bring the N up here to almost solar, and the depletion has gone. So that's a good explanation why comets are depleted, apparently depleted, but they are not. So that's the salt, be, be careful. And finally, how much <laughs> material did comets deliver to Earth? Um, we get this from the xenon, the 22% xenon plus error limits. And then you have to assume how much xenon the Earth lost and when the cometary impacts actually happened. And then you get something like this here. So the initial atmospheric xenon would be here and the present day atmospheric xenon here. And you see, in maximum, you get about 1% of water, of the terrestrial water, is actually cometary, which does not change the D over H on Earth. That's clear. However, the mass of the Earth is this here, surface water, one per mil, delivered by comets. In this case, it's 10 to the 19 kilograms. And organics delivered by comets, and just taking the volatiles and semi-volatiles, it's 10 to the 17 kilograms, which is quite a lot for the organic inventory of the Earth on the surface. So comets do not contain life. We haven't seen any animals, just mine, but uh, <laughs> no living animals at least, but throw it in water. And uh, maybe that's how life sparked with all the prebiotic molecule we find in comets. So Rosina results really did something for the understanding of this uh, pathway here. Xenon isotope, silicon isotope tell us something about the composition of the original interstellar medium. The sulfur tells us something about uh, these dark molecular clouds where sulfur is missing. O2S2 about this star forming region. Then uh, the very volatiles about temperatures in the protosolar nebula. The overage in water about something about the formation of the solar system. And finally, the noble gases together with the organics may be something about evolution of life. So Rosetta was 
10 years of Rosina was 10 years of planning. It started in 85, before we were at Comatari. Yeah. We started to plan 10 years of construction and design, 10 years of cruise, and now 10 years of data analysis. <laughs> and still a lot of questions to be answered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katrin. Questions, comments? From uh, the various results from the isotopic ratios to the now world famous zoo and all, all of these measurements you've done, can you pinpoint better the range of, of temperature and therefore maybe the distance from the, the protocellar nebula where the comets form? And then you tempted to say that it's not formed in a warm environment. It's, it's definitely not formed in a warm environment. Otherwise, S2 would have gone. So how do you so put the results from, uh, from Stardust with some uh, really high temperature grains? I, well, it, probably you get grains from the inside out there. This is known, it, it, it's ejected and then joins the, the outer solar system somewhere. And we don't know if the comet uh, will too is actually the same as this here. So we have to have more comet missions <laughs> to explore more comets, that's clear. But my explanation is that dust gets ejected from the sun environment into the outer solar system and is then incorporated. Actually, Cosima didn't really find any of these CIAs. They have a tentative detection, maybe, but no, they didn't. So we don't know. Further questions? Yeah, thank you. I did not get the link with the cosmic ray. There was a slide on enrichment of cosmic ray. What it is exactly? To, to form from H to S these refractories. How, how do you get rid of H to S? Because if, if the sulfur would be in H to S, you should be able to see it by remote sensing from, from with telescopes in these clouds, even if it's on ice. But H2S is not there. And one explanation is that H2S was efficiently processed by cosmic rays. And then it's in a refractory phase which does not sublimate and which is invisible to what you look at. It's still there. That's for astronomers. About the organic sets that were brought to Earth and may have contributed to the formation of life, is there anything where we think it wasn't there on the Earth itself? The problem on the Earth is a little bit the concentration. You know these, these vents in the oceans? I think you dilute your molecules pretty fast. And so even comets, if you throw them in an ocean, it's maybe a no-go for life. Better throw it either on solid earth, because they bring the water with them, or throw it in a lake. So there is a, a nice paper comet pond. <laughs> because you, you need a, a high concentration of organics, some liquid water, and some minerals to actually spark life, probably. And this, uh, it seems, I'm not a specialist in this, but people tell me in the ocean you have difficulties to do that. With, uh, with all this uh, list of numerous uh, isotopic ratios or organics you've discovered, what more are we going to get from eventually a next cometary mission like CESAR, which is bringing samples? Do we really need to bring back the samples, or can we just flow another okay, Rosina? See. Caesar is, is another problem. Caesar will bring back warm material. That means no ice. And uh, they try to separate the volatiles from the refractories. But then you have seven years of chemistry on the way back. The refractories you might get back to the atmosphere of the Earth. 
But uh, we, we know that these refractories are very fluffy grains. Now they go through 30 G. They won't be fluffy afterwards. Uh, they will be shocked by this. And they will probably also ha no longer be very pristine. So uh, Caesar is a marginal mission, which actually should not be done. <laughs> Because if you do a comet mission, then you go to another comet first. Then you can do some measurements, and then you can still bring material back. But at least you have some science there, which Caesar will, will not have. Let me get the picture of Rosetta, which is nice. Probably they're going through the same comet. <laughs> they are going the same comet. They will land during Apelion, which means in the northern hemisphere. And they will just grab the uh, upper layer of, of the comet, so they will get the least pristine material available on the comet. Which is uh, it's just stupid, because it's not cheap. <laughs> so uh, they should have done this different. Sample return, what they can get is this inorganic, uh, organic insoluble material, which Cosima found. This will probably come back as such. They will also get uh, isotopic ratios in, in, the, in this material, which they didn't get for Stardust. They got it only of the, of the minerals, not of the organics. But you see, with Stardust, the, the, the organics did not survive this impact. Why should they survive the, the 30 G in the Earth's atmosphere? Okay, what should be done then? <laughs> I, I think Europe should, should really prepare for a big mission with a big land. You have to do it in situ. You have to drill, you have to go deeper into the comet and see the structure of the material, see the, the, if, if the ice is amorphous or, or crystalline. Uh, look at, at how, how it's distributed if the ice is around dust grains or in between dust grains, this would tell you a lot about solar system formation. But this you cannot do with a mission and with a sample return, at least not now. You would need a cryogenic sample return with a drill, at least one meter deep, and then bring it back cryogenically <laughs> and through the atmosphere very gently. <laughs> Maybe to the gateway to the moon, that would, might be easier, I don't know. But that's in the very far future, I guess. It should be our goal, finally, to do. But uh, first, let's do a, a nice lander, an active lander, not, not just throw it down. <laughs> With more payload, more mass, and uh, that would be great. And go to another comet. Because we really have statistics of one, or one and a half, when we talk about having. This is not good enough. Okay. <coughs> Thanks a lot again. <laughs> we have coffee outside. <laughs>